How do we identify acids and bases? According to the Arrhenius theory, acids release hydrogen ions in solution and bases release hydroxide ions. A salt and water are generally what are formed when an Arrhenius acid and base react together. A salt is an ionic compound that doesn't contain hydrogen ions or hydroxide. Here are some examples of Arrhenius acids, Arrhenius bases, and salts. We could come up with a parent acid and parent base that react to form a salt. Looking at sodium acetate, the parent acid would be acetic acid, and the parent base would be sodium hydroxide. The problem with the Arrhenius definition is that some substances which acted like acids and bases could not be classified using it. Chemists Johann Bronsted and Thomas Lowry suggested a broader definition of acids and bases. A Bronsted-Lowry acid is a substance or species that donates a hydrogen ion, and a Bronsted-Lowry base is a substance or species that accepts a hydrogen ion. In the example below, the hydrochloric acid is donating a hydrogen ion to the water molecule. Therefore, the hydrochloric acid is acting as a Bronsted-Lowry acid. Since the water accepts the hydrogen ion, it is acting as a Bronsted-Lowry base. In this reaction, the hydronium ion is a product. Hydronium is just a water molecule with an extra hydrogen ion. When two substances differ by one hydrogen ion, they are called a conjugate pair. In this example, both the forward and reverse reactions occur. The water is acting as an acid since it is donating a proton. The ammonia is a base because it is accepting the proton from the water. Likewise, the ammonium is an acid and the hydroxide is a base, based on what we can see about them either accepting or donating a proton. There are two acids and two bases in a Bronsted-Lowry equilibrium. An acid and base react to form another acid and base. The ammonia and ammonium are one conjugate pair, as are the water and hydroxide. A substance that has the ability to act as an acid or base is called an amphiprotic substance. Water is a common amphiprotic substance along with many anions. For instance, bicarbonate can act as an acid or a base. These substances must have a proton to donate and be able to accept a proton. Besides water, uncharged species are generally not amphiprotic, although ammonia is one exception. Let's do a quick nomenclature review for acids and bases. If the acid is hydrogen something ide, then we change it to hydro something ic acid. Hydrogen phosphide is an example. Since it is a hydrogen ide acid, we can call it hydrophosphoric acid. If the acid ends in 8, we lose the hydrogen part and change the ending to ic. Hydrogen acetate, or acetic acid, is an example. Endings of ite we change to ous. For example, we can call hydrogen hypocarbonate hypocarbonous acid. The by prefix means we have added a proton to the formula. While we are at it, why don't we come up with the conjugate bases for all these acids? They would be dihydrogen phosphide, acetate, bihypocarbonite, and phosphate. Ions need to be present for a solution to conduct electricity. Although both acids are the same concentration, the hydrochloric acid conducts electricity much better than the acetic acid. Water splits some or all of the acid molecules into ions through a process called ionization. Strong acids ionize completely while weak acids only partially ionize. Hydrochloric acid is a strong acid, so it ionizes completely. Note the equation uses a one-way arrow. In the example we showed earlier, we could see the acetic acid conducts electricity poorly. We can infer that there are less ions in the solution and most of the molecules of acetic acid remain intact. Therefore, acetic acid is a weak acid. In the equation, we use an equilibrium arrow, which signifies how the acid only partially ionizes. Likewise, bases can also be strong or weak. Strong bases are usually oxides or hydroxides of group 1 and 2 metals. Based on the reactions of acids and bases with water, we can write an equilibrium expression. From this, we get a Ka value or a Kb value. The Ka value is known as the acid ionization constant, while the Kb value is known as the base ionization constant. We don't include the concentration of water in the expression because it is a constant. The larger the Ka or Kb value, the greater the concentration of hydronium or hydroxide, respectively. 
We use the relative strengths of bronsted lowry acids and bases table to compare the relative strengths of weak acids and bases. Acids are on the left and bases are on the right. Acid strength increases going up the table and base strength increases going down. All acids below the big six are weak. Although hydroxide and ammonia are listed on the left side of the table, they do not act as acids in water. The conjugate bases of strong acids, such as chloride and bromide, do not act as weak bases in water. Amphiprotic ions appear on both sides of the table. The table also lists the Ka values for weak acids at room temperature. How readily an acid releases a hydrogen ion depends on its structure. The strength of a binary acid depends on the attraction between the nucleus of the hydrogen atom and the electrons that surround the other atom. Additionally, there is also an attraction between the nucleus of the other atom and the electron of the hydrogen atom. As the size of the other atom increases, the distance between the nucleus of one atom and the electrons of its neighbor increases. A longer distance leads to a longer bond length, less bond strength, and a stronger acid. Looking at the binary acids of the halogen family, hydrofluoric acid is the weakest due to the strong bond between fluorine and hydrogen. The strongest is hydroiodic acid, which has the longest bond length. Binary acids with more than one hydrogen atom are weaker because the presence of more hydrogen atoms bound to the central atom strengthens the bonds. This is a good time to recall Coulomb's law, a law which states that like charges repel and opposite charges attract, with a force proportional to the product of the charges and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. The effective nuclear charges of the molecules bonded to the hydrogen do not change, so the charges are constant. However, the distance r does change, and this explains why the force changes. The greater the distance, the weaker the force of attraction, and the stronger the acid is. The strength of ternary or oxoacids depends on two things. The number of oxygen atoms and the electronegativity of the central nonmetal atom. When the OH bond is polarized, ternary acids ionize more easily. When the pair of electrons shared between the oxygen and hydrogen atoms is drawn away from the hydrogen towards the center of the molecule, the bond is polarized. The presence of more oxygen atoms and a central atom that is highly electronegative causes this to happen most readily. The strength of carboxylic acids also depends on the polarization of the OH bond. If the carbon skeleton is shorter, and if there are electronegative atoms attached to the carbon skeleton, the bond is more polarizable. Here we need to rank the compounds from strongest to weakest. As the central atom size increases, the bond strength decreases. This means that hydroiodic acid is stronger than hydrobromic acid, which is stronger than hydrochloric acid. More hydrogen atoms leads to stronger bonds, so the compounds with more hydrogen atoms are weaker. Selenium is larger than sulfur, and sulfur is larger than oxygen, so hydrosilenic acid is stronger than hydrosulfuric acid, which is stronger than water. Methane contains four hydrogen atoms and is the weakest acid present in this example. In this example, we need to rank sulfurous acid, perchloric acid, and bromic acid from strongest to weakest. More oxygen atoms leads to a stronger acid, so perchloric acid must be the strongest. Since the electronegativity of bromine is higher than that of sulfur, its bonds are more polarizable, and bromic acid is the stronger acid. The relative strengths of bronsted lowry acids and bases determines the position of the equilibrium. An equilibrium constant greater than 1 means the products are favored, while an equilibrium constant less than 1 means the reactants are favored. The equilibrium position is determined by the strongest acid and strongest base reacting. We use the Ka table to determine which is the strongest acid, and the equilibrium will favor the reaction in the direction of the stronger acid and base forming the weaker acid and base. Essentially, we can think of this as a stronger acid and base pushing away. Let's say we are given this equilibrium and we are told the reactants are favored. This means the equilibrium constant is small. From this we can conclude that hypochlorous acid is the stronger acid here and ammonia is the strongest base, since the strong acid and base push away. When reacting two amphiprotic species, the stronger acid will donate the hydrogen ion. When reacting an amphiprotic substance with water, we compare the Ka to the Kb of the amphiprotic substance to determine which reaction occurs to a greater extent. Here we must determine whether the products or reactants will be favored when bisulfite is reacted with binoxalate. Both species are amphiprotic. 
bisulfite is a stronger acid than binoxalate, so it will act as an acid and donate a hydrogen ion. We then compare the acid in the forward reaction, bisulfate, to the acid in the reverse reaction, oxalic acid, using our Ka table. Oxalic acid is above bisulfate, so it is stronger and will donate protons more readily. Therefore, the reactants are favored. According to the Ka table, all strong acids in water are equally strong and ionize 100%. This means that in a solution of strong acid, no molecules of the strong acid remain. Only the anion and hydronium remain. This is the same for bases, which dissociate completely to form hydroxide ions. The strongest acid and base in aqueous solutions are hydronium and hydroxide. Any acid that is stronger than hydronium reacts with water to form hydronium, so no acid stronger than hydronium exists in water. Water levels the strengths of strong acids and bases, meaning that the strength of a strong acid is leveled by how basic the solvent is, and the strength of a strong base is leveled by how acidic the solvent is. For instance, perchloric acid and nitric acid are both completely ionized in water and are both equally strong acids. If we were to react some of these acids with solvents other than water, their difference in strengths might become more apparent. One way to compare the strength of acid-base conjugate pairs in the lab is by using indicators. An equilibrium equation for a monoprotic weak acid reacting with an indicator would look something like this. If the weak acid is stronger than the acidic form of the indicator, then the equilibrium will shift to the right, forming more of the acidic form of the indicator. Since the acidic form of the indicator is red, the red color would predominate in the solution. However, if we had an acid that was weaker than the acid form of the indicator, then the reaction would shift left. This would make more of the basic form of the indicator, turning the solution yellow. We could organize these into a table, similar to the table of the relative strengths of bronsted lowry acids we use in this chapter. Acid 1 we determined was the strongest, so it will go at the very top. The indicator goes below, and acid 2, which was weaker than the indicator, can go below that. Here's an example of something you might see if you were to do one of these experiments. The colors of the solutions can help you determine which of the conjugate pairs contains the strongest acid and which contains the weakest. For practice, pause the video and try to order the acids from strongest to weakest based on your observations. Use hydrochloric acid and sodium hydroxide as references. Alright, so hopefully you had a chance to put them in order. From strongest to weakest, we have acid 3, acid 1, and acid 2. Ionization of water Water is an amphiprotic molecule, which means it can form both hydronium and hydroxide ions when it reacts. Therefore, it can act as a bronson lowry weak acid or weak base. Auto-ionization occurs when a water molecule donates a proton to another water molecule. The word auto means self. So auto-ionization means the same thing as self-ionization. By looking at the equilibrium equation, we are able to create an equilibrium constant expression. The water ionization constant is the concentration of hydroxide multiplied by the concentration of hydronium at a given temperature. At 25 degrees Celsius, the water constant is 1 times 10 to the power of negative 14. At 25 degrees Celsius, what is the concentration of hydronium ions in water? Using the KW equation, we are able to use algebra to solve for x. Since there is a 1 to 1 stoichiometry ratio between the hydronium and the hydroxide ions, they will both have the same concentration. If we increase the temperature, then there will be a right shift because the forward reaction is endothermic. Endothermic reactions are more sensitive to temperature change, hence an increase in temperature will cause both the forward and reverse rate to increase but the forward rate will increase more than the reverse. This will lead to an increase in products. In the end, although the concentration of both hydronium and hydroxide ions have increased, the solution remains neutral. This is because to the concentration of both ions still remain equal. When a strong acid or base is added to water, they ionize or dissociate 100%. For example, a 1 liter solution of 1 molar hydrochloric acid, one of the strong acids, contains 1 mole of hydronium ions and 1 mole of chloride ions. It is the same idea when a strong base dissociates in water. Remember that the concentration of hydronium is inversely proportional to the concentration of hydroxide ions. 
When the concentration of hydronium ions is greater than the concentration of hydroxide ions, the solution is acidic. When the concentration of hydroxide ions is greater than the concentration of hydronium ions, the solution is basic. Finally, when the two concentrations are equal, the solution is neutral. What are the concentrations of hydronium antihydroxide in 0 0.70 molar hydroiodic acid at 25 degrees Celsius? Is the solution acidic or basic? Justify. Since we are dealing with a strong acid, its concentration will be equal to the hydronium concentration. This gives us 0 0.70 moles per liter. We can plug this value into our KW expression to get the concentration of hydroxide. Since the concentration of hydronium is greater than the concentration of hydroxide, the solution must be acidic. What is the final hydronium concentration in a solution when 25 mL of 0.30 molar hydrochloric acid is added to 35 mL of 0.50 molar sodium hydroxide? We are dealing with a strong acid and strong base, so they ionize and dissociate 100%. However, we must take into account the dilution factor because we are adding these two things together. By multiplying the initial concentrations by the volume of the initial solution, divided by the total volume of the solution, we get our concentrations of hydronium and hydroxide. These will be lower because the solutions were diluted. Hydroxide is in excess, so we must subtract the concentration of hydronium from hydroxide to give us the concentration of hydroxide left over. We can then plug this into our KW expression to get the final concentration of hydronium. Calculating pH and pOH. In 1909, the great Danish chemist S.P.L. Sorensen created the pH scale. This scale uses logarithmic rules to specify the concentration of hydronium within a solution. Another interpretation of the pH is the power of hydrogen. We define pH as a negative log of the molar concentration of hydronium ions. To convert from pH to the concentration of hydronium in a solution, we can take the anti-logarithm of the negative pH value. To convert from the concentration of hydroxide ions in a solution to pOH, take the negative log of the concentration of hydroxide ions. If we want to convert pOH to the concentration of hydroxide ions, we can take the anti-logarithm of the negative pOH value. Conversions, going from pH to pOH and vice versa. The sum of pH and pOH equals 14, which is commonly known as the pKW. This means if we want to find the value of pH, we can subtract the pOH from 14. Here are two pictures that can help you visualize the conversions of these values. The next chapter also involves the values such as pH, pOH, and much more. So it is a great thing to just master these scales so it can help you in the next chapter. The logarithm of a number is the power to which 10 must be raised to obtain that number. Note that the log of a product of two numbers, log a times b, equals the sum of the logs of those two numbers. In this example, we are taking the log of 3.5 times 10 to the negative 3. We can break this apart into two separate logs. The 10 to the negative 3 is exact and will not impact our sig figs. This is because it is an order of magnitude, not a measured value, so it really has an infinite number of sig figs. On the other hand, the 3.5 is only good to two sig figs, and it will determine the number of sig figs in the answer. When we are summing the values, precision determines the number of sig figs. The first value is good to the second decimal place, while the second has infinite sig figs. Therefore, our final answer will be good to two decimal places. When going from the concentration of hydronium to pH, the significant figures of the concentration will tell you the number of digits to place after the decimal. For example, what is the pH when the concentration of hydronium ions is 0 0.0030 moles per liter? Since the concentration had only two sig figs, our pH value will have two digits after the decimal place, giving us an answer of 2.52. Remember, pH and pOH do not have any units, as they are actually exponents or orders of magnitude, rather than measurements. When going from pH to the concentration of hydronium ions, the number of digits after the decimal place of the pH value determines the significant figure of the concentration of hydronium ions. For example, what is the concentration of hydronium ions when the pH is 1.1? 1 
Since the pH only had one digit after the decimal place, the concentration of hydronium ion will only have one significant figure. Remember, since in this case we are finding the concentration, we must use the units for molarity. Determine the pOH, hydronium concentration, and hydroxide concentration of an aqueous solution of acetyl salicylic acid that has a pH of 2.37. To get the hydronium concentration, we take 10 to the power of our negative pH. Because there are two decimal places, we get an answer with two sig figs. We get our pOH by subtracting the pH from 14. For our hydroxide concentration, we just take 10 to the power of the negative pOH value we just got. We can quickly check over our answers by multiplying the hydroxide concentration by the hydronium concentration. If our answer does not come out to be 1 times 10 to the negative 14, then it's likely we did something wrong. When we pour two solutions together, we must remember to use our dilution factor to get accurate starting concentrations. If the initial concentration of hydronium is greater than that of hydroxide, then we must subtract the hydroxide concentration from the hydronium to give us the actual concentration of hydronium. If the hydroxide concentration is greater than that of hydronium, then we must subtract the hydronium concentration from the hydroxide concentration because it will react. Then we get the hydroxide we are left with. Determine the pH of the solution that results when 50 mL of 0.4 molar sulfuric acid is mixed with 100 mL of 0.5 molar sodium hydroxide. For starters, we will find the initial concentration of both hydroxide and hydronium, and since we are mixing two solutions, there will be a dilution factor that comes in play. The starting concentration of hydronium is 0.267 molar, and for hydroxide it is 0.333 molar. Since the starting concentration of hydroxide is greater than the concentration of hydronium, we know that hydroxide will be in excess. We get the concentration of excess hydroxide by subtracting the initial hydronium concentration from the initial hydroxide concentration. This gives us a value of 0.066 moles per liter. We can convert this into pOH by taking the negative log of the final hydroxide concentration. Then we get our value for pH by subtracting the pOH from 14. Ka and Kb. Before we begin to go through the calculations, taking a look at this triangle might be helpful. The three apexes are labeled K, initial concentration, and equilibrium concentration. We can also go from the equilibrium concentration to the pH or pOH. Two of these three values are always given. We then have to find the third. Most of the substances we identify as acids ionize only to a slight extent in water. For instance, hydrofluoric acid does not ionize completely. This is where we use the term weak acid. A strong acid ionizes 100%, while for a weak acid, the concentration of hydronium is much less than the original concentration of the acid. This is why in 0.1 molar hydrofluoric acid there will not be 0.1 molar hydronium ions. By using an ice table, we are able to calculate the equilibrium concentration of a chemical species given the initial concentration and the value of the equilibrium constant. The acid ionization constant, Ka, is calculated by the concentration of the conjugate base multiplied by the concentration of the hydronium ion over the concentration of our weak acid. In type 1 problems, we are calculating the pH or the hydronium concentration of a weak acid. We are given the concentration of the weak acid and its Ka value. We can refer back to the triangle quickly to see visually how two values are given and that we must use them to find the third. In these problems, we use an ice chart. I stands for initial concentration, C stands for change in concentration, and E stands for equilibrium concentration. In this case, we're using double arrows because not all the reactants turn into products. One tip is to make sure you know what you are trying to find. In this case, it is the hydronium concentration, and from that we can obtain our pH value. Also, as liquid water's concentration is essentially constant during the reaction, it may be ignored in the ice chart. At the end of a type 1 problem, you will be using a Ka equation to figure out the concentration of a hydronium ion. And at this point, you will need the x to be negligible for you to easily solve this question. This is done when percent ionization is within 5%. If the percent ionization is greater than 5%, we must take account of a value x and use a longer way to figure out the concentration of the hydronium ion. Percent ionization is calculated by 
the concentration of hydronium over the concentration of the weak acid multiplied by 100. Make sure you show all the work when using a longer way to figure out the concentration of hydronium. Also, when x is negligible, make sure you write that on the question so your teacher knows what you're talking about. Hydrogen sulfide is a poisonous flammable gas which has a rotten egg smell. Calculate the pH of 0 0.700 molar hydrosulfuric acid. The Ka value is 9.1 times 10 to the negative 8, which we can get off of our acid and bases table. We have our initial concentration and Ka values and we need to find the pH. This requires finding the equilibrium concentration of hydronium first. To do this, we need to write the equation and set up our ice box. Once we have this filled in, we will write our Ka expression and fill in the values from our ice box. We assume X is negligible and then can quickly find the concentration of hydronium. Now we check if X is negligible by calculating the percent ionization. We end up getting a value that is under 5%, therefore we were safe to assume X was negligible when we stated it earlier. After checking this, we can finally calculate the pH. Here's a quick tip for determining whether or not X, or the percentage ionization, is negligible. If the initial concentration of acid is at least 1,000 times larger than the Ka value, the assumption is valid. If we are dealing with a base, then its initial concentration must be 1,000 times larger than the Kb value. To easily determine if the percent ionization will be below 5%, we divide the initial concentration by the Ka value. In this example on the right, we are dealing with a base. When we divide its initial concentration by the Kb value, we get a number that is greater than 1,000. This means that the percent ionization is less than 5% and we can assume X is negligible. In type 2 problems, our main objective is to find the initial concentration of the weak acid using the pH and our Ka values given to us. In this type of problem, we must use ice tables. Since we are finding the initial concentrations, X will be placed in the initial part of the ice table. In most of these problems, there will be no product concentrations in the initial row, so the products will have a positive change and the reactants will have a negative change. What concentration of benzoic acid is required to produce a solution with a pH of 4.10? Since we are talking about the initial concentration of a weak acid, X will be placed in the initial part of the ice table. Before we set up our ice table, we need to convert the pH into the concentration of hydronium at equilibrium. We can then plug our known values and the changes we know must have occurred into the ice table. Any solutions given pH or concentration is the equilibrium value, while the stated concentration of the species, or the concentration stated on the label, is the initial concentration. Now we create a Ka expression to solve for X, which is the initial concentration of the weak acid. Type 3 problems are actually the easiest to solve because all the information to fill your ice table is given. We have our initial and equilibrium concentrations and we need to use them to solve for the Ka value of the weak acid. Because there are no unknown values in our ice table, we need to make sure we understand what the initial and equilibrium concentrations are. A 0 0.100 molar solution of lactic acid is found to have a pH of 2.27. We must calculate the Ka value of this weak acid. The pH that we are given actually allows us to find our equilibrium concentration of hydronium. The molarity that we were given for lactic acid is its initial concentration. We must subtract the change of hydronium from our initial concentration of lactic acid to get its equilibrium concentration. As long as we did everything right for our ice table, the next step is pretty straightforward. We can plug our values into the Ka expression, which gives us our Ka value. The problems we are given for weak bases are very similar to those of weak acids, but there's one extra step. We need to find the base ionization constant, Kb. This is not as straightforward as finding the Ka value, because that one we can take right off our Ka table. We need to do an extra calculation to get our Kb if it's not given to us. To get our Kb value, we must divide the water ionization constant by the Ka of the conjugate acid. 
Here we need to find the base ionization constant of ammonia. We can find the Ka of the conjugate acid in our relative strengths of bronsted lowry acids and bases table. If we divide the Kw by the Ka of the conjugate acid, we can get our Kb for ammonia. More commonly, we would deal with something like this, where finding the Kb is only one step of the problem. What concentration of ammonia would be required to produce a solution of pH 10.50? Well, we just calculated the Kb, so all we need to do now is convert the pH at equilibrium into the concentration of hydroxide ions. By subtracting the pH from 14, we get our pOH value. We can then use the pOH to get the hydroxide concentration. Now that we have the concentration of hydroxide, we can plug its values and the change values into the ice table. The initial concentration of ammonia is x because that's what we want to find. We can now use our Kb value and the Kb expression to isolate x. This comes out to be 0.0059 molar. Calculate the pH of the solution produced when 16 grams of ammonium nitrate is dissolved in enough water to produce a 500 milliliter solution. The 16 grams and 500 milliliters will help us get our initial concentration and we can get the Ka or Kb values from our data booklet. Using the values given to us and the molar mass of ammonium nitrate, we can get our molarity. We then make a dissociation equation to find the ions in solution. This is actually an example of a hydrolysis calculation, which will be discussed in the next video, covering topics from Chapter 6. The salt ammonium nitrate produces an acidic cation and a neutral spectating anion, nitrate. Since the ammonium is a weak acid, this is simply a Ka ice problem. We create a nice table and solve for our x value, which is a concentration of hydronium. Now that we've done that, we can set up our Ka expression and solve for x. The change to the initial concentration by x is negligible because the percentage ionization comes out to be less than 5%. Now that we have our hydronium concentration, we simply convert that to our pH to give us our final answer.